general break for coffee, um, but I won't take up any time. I'll turn it over to Santim for Pan African thoughts and the international dimension. All right, so I am the chair and discuss it for this uh, panel. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do for this panel is actually sort of preface it with a discussion um, before we start with the panels about how we started or how we put this panel together. Um, so much of what we do in the academy appears that we just like sort of put things together without all of this work and discussion behind it. So I kind of wanted to, um, I guess, talk about some of the work and the discussion that went into um, putting this panel together. Also because uh, the, I talked a lot with panelists about what we were going to do today. So instead of me um, being a discussant after the um, panelists talk, I thought I'd sort of just preface um, what we're trying to do here. Um, unfortunately, John Sosky can't come uh, to the panel today. He was an integral part of the discussions that I was having about putting this uh, panel together. Unfortunately, he has a migraine and he says he's just feeling awful and terrible. And although he's in Toronto, he can't make it uh, to the panel. Um, I tried everything to get him here, but he just feels so bad. In any case, so a lot of my uh, comments that I'm going to make here are sort of with uh, John Sosky in mind. Um, so when we started talking about doing this Cabral workshop, um, a lot of what was emphasized was sort of doing more country-specific case studies that emphasize uh, post-colonial state histories and their failures. Um, and in sort of talking about doing the workshop, one of the things that struck me was that if, if we just sort of did those uh, country-specific case studies that emphasize this uh, sort of post-colonial state histories, and their failures, we would sort of take national boundaries for granted, and we also take the nat African national struggles um, as founded by and bounded by the nation state. And um, it would assume what, it, what needs to be explained, and it still se seems to need to be, uh, something that I guess needs to still, you know, jumbling up my word, it's, it, although it seems counterintuitive, we have these nation states and so on, it seems to me that um, African nationalism and its national boundaries and so on need, still need to be explained. Why do these boundaries exist? Why African nationalism, etc.? Um, it was also about, in sort of talking to the panelists, it was also my sense that a certain kind of periodi periodization of African nationalism um, is taken for granted. Um, and um, I think that periodization is one that sees um, African nationalism as this point where Africans um, were kind of awoken into a kind of universal consciousness, one that would allow them to take part in sort of capital H history and one in which Africans would finally become universal subjects. Um, but then I, the problem then becomes that the post-colonial post state is seen as this failure that kind of corrupted this um, attempt of Africans to attain this kind of universal um, subjectivity. Um, I think a lot of that Afro-pessimism Afro is um, kind of um, seen to be Fanonian in, in, in its inflection, but it seems to me that it's kind of emptied out of history, it, or it empties out um, the history of African nationalism. Um, so what escapes from view is the dynamism, the creativity, and the uniqueness of African nationalism, which has its own specificities as a story of human struggle, a struggle that, uh, and, a, and a story that can be appropriated by subsequent ge generations in different ways, but always in the name of human struggle and freedom. So in our panel today, the one on Pan-Africanism, uh, we wanted to um, think more closely about how African nationalist thought has always been about race, it's always been about the Caribbean, it's always been about North America, and it's always been about internationalism, as much as, as it's been about Africa narrowly <coughs> conceived. Um, so again, this panel, what I was trying to do, I guess, was to think about how African nationalist thought tells us a, new, uh, tells us a unique story about the struggle for human dignity. Um, that was informed by people and things that are normally outside of what is considered state history, but, but that in fact is constitutive of what became 
part of the African uh, post-independence post nationalist state. Um, okay, so finally, I just wanted to read a, a statement from the opening of Wretched of the Earth, where Fanon says, we could go on to portray the rise of a new nation, the establishment of a new nation, its diplomatic relations, and its economic and political orientation. But instead, we have decided to describe the tabula rasa which from the outside defines any decolonization. So thinking about that statement, it seems to me that that tabula rasa has yet to be described, and, and I don't think this panel will you know, do that, but maybe you could point us in different directions so that we can begin to actually describe that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Seth um, Markle, who's an assistant professor of history and international studies at Trinity College. His current research project examines how post-colonial national state formation in Tanzania shaped the transnational practices and diaspora identities of black radicals from the U.S. during the 1960s and 70s. He's co-founder of a number of different projects, um, and he has a number of projects on the way. Um, in theory? Uh, in theory. <laughs> <laughs> He'll... Good afternoon. So uh, I'd like to first start off by uh, thanking um, Cincinnati David and other sponsors of New York University for bringing me in at the last minute. You know, uh, I, I didn't, I knew about this, and uh, I knew I wasn't going to be able to come as, a, uh, as someone just to observe. And then, as luck would have it, somebody dropped out, and as luck would have it, friends with uh, Helena, and uh, and, and uh, this helped out. Uh, because I feel like this is uh, something that I, I'm really interested in, in, in sharing when we kind of revisit Pan-Africanism. So the title of my paper is I Hear Rumblings in the Great Society, and that's a phrase taken from the person I'm going to be talking about today, which is uh, Abdul Rahman Muhammad Babu um, and the Black Power Movement in the United States. I actually didn't bring my PowerPoint, so I was making a PowerPoint by scratch. I was, everybody was eating, but I have enough. I just want to show some images. I'm going to play a, uh, at least a minute and a half clip um, from on YouTube uh, uh, with Malcolm X. But again, uh, before I get into the paper, uh, you know, the conversations and, and type of dialogue we've been having so far, um, you know, I don't talk about Cabral per se, but Cabral in many ways has influenced uh, the way I, I, I look at this project because uh, he came to, Tan to United, no, Cabral came to the United States uh, in the 1970s. And when he spoke at Syracuse, he also spoke to a group of African American uh, political activists. Uh, and one of the things these African Americans asked him was, um, what do you think about the, the, the role of African Americans in the African liberation struggle? And Cabral said, you have a role to play, but your role uh, remains in the United States. Do not come to Africa. And one of the reasons is, is kind of this cultural dislocation, this inability of African Americans maybe to culturally assimilate in a way where they'll get to know this kind of struggle and participate in a fully effective manner. And so that struck me because it is this dialogue that's happening, right? When we were going through the first panel, I kept thinking, how does uh, Cabral respond to diaspora, right? How does he respond to stateless subjects in a time when states are ultimately in conversation and practicing with one another? And so diaspora is somehow outside of that. Uh, and so my idea was to try to approach that question of Pan-Africanism in the 60s and 70s uh, by looking at uh, Babu and looking at Malcolm X. Uh, and I want to take you through that, that process of how I first got to the project. And then I'm going to read a little bit from uh, this essay and, and talk off the cuff a little bit. One of the reasons here that I try to revisit uh, Babu is because when we look at the 60s and African nationalism, it's oftentimes the same individuals, the founding fathers of nations, you know, so we get the Nereres, the Cabrals, we get the uh, Lumbas, we get the Nkrumas, uh, the Senghors, etc., etc. So there are other African nationalists uh, that don't necessarily get the attention that they deserve, and I, and I think Babu is, is, is one of them. And so try to bring him back into the conversation. But there's also something very interesting about Babu in the sense that in the research that I've conducted, he was at least one of the first African nationalists that coming out of Tanzania that started to engage with black nationalist ideas coming out of the United States in a way that is both critical but not dismissive. So, to begin here, uh, for those of the uh, Bandung generation, Abdul 
Rahman Muhammad Babu is often memorialized as one of Africa's radical intellectual giants who helped defeat U.S. imperialism, quote, in the hearts and minds of world opinion, and as a man who put human brotherhood above glory of the home and state, while managing not to drown in, quote, narrow insular nationalism or Marxist ideological dogmatism. Indeed, a cursory glance at the political career of this Zanzibar nationalist and Africanist and socialist internationalist Uh, Zanzibar nationalist, pan african socialist, internationalist, one that spanned close to five decades, is reason alone to carve out a place for Babu in the collective memory of all concerned with the continuing task of liberation in Africa, end quote. This paper takes up this uh, very notion of Babu's centrality by examining aspects of his contributions to African <coughs> nationalist thought at a moment of worldwide ideological ferment. Now, that was, that was pulled from some memories of Babu from some of his closest friends and comrades. Now, if you look back to the 60s, Babu um, was ultimately vilified in the, in, the, in the Western press. Once the Zanzibar Revolution broke out in 1974, all of a sudden this person, Babu, comes on the international radar and comes into our international consciousness. However, the way that he is characterized, he's characterized as a villain, he's characterized as this kind of madman communist, and I use madman because they actually use that terminology, he's a madman. He's the one responsible for the communist takeover in East Africa. And so we see this vilification. And in some ways, back in the 60s, oftentimes activists felt that you weren't really identified as an anti-imperialist activist until you're vilified in the press, the Western press. That means you made it, you know. Uh, and so Babu, and I think for Malcolm, um, Malcolm was someone who read uh, New York Times, Washington Post um, extensively, and so I'm sure he was introduced to Babu uh, around 1964, 63, uh, and that would begin to uh, start at least the relationship that I'm going to go over um, throughout this essay. Uh, could you pass me the picture? In the outline to Babu's unfinished memoir, which is captured in this text right here. Uh, in a section titled The Creation of Tanzania, Abdul Rahman Muhammad Babu devotes a lengthy paragraph to his encounters with the U.S. black nationalist leader Malcolm X. Babu wrote, and I quote, I had known Malcolm earlier in Africa and we became close friends. Five weeks before his assassination, we had a crucial all-night meeting at my hotel in New York, attended by Mary Baraka, Shabazz, Malcolm's aide, and two leaders of the black student movement. The memoir will discuss the burning question of the time, the question of race and class, and of the two which was primary and which was secondary. This was one of Malcolm's last meetings, which I value enormously." End quote. At the International Conference on Malcolm X, held in New York City in November 1990, 25 years after Malcolm's assassination, and roughly around the time Babu was penning the outline to his memoir, he again addressed his relationship with Malcolm and its significance for arriving at an understanding of what unites Africans and African Americans. Here, Babu's reflections ring with nostalgia in his description of Malcolm's political evolution yet not to the extent that it submerges a critical lesson. To a crowd of mostly black American activists, intellectuals, and students, he stated, quote, your nationalism and our nationalism are the same. Our nationalism and your nationalism have nothing to do with dingoism. It is a nationalism of resistance. It is a positive nationalism. And this must be expressed within the context of American hegemony. And he continues, Quote, although American imperialism was supposedly fighting communism throughout this period, you find that American presidents, uh, every American president had to have a third world leader, a third world leader as villain. So he talks about Mao, Castro, Ho Chi Minh, and eventually also Babu fits within that category. Now when I first came across Babu's memories of Malcolm, in particular as a grad student, conducting preliminary research on the history of historical interplay between the black freedom struggle in the USA and post-colonial state formation in Tanzania, things started to make more sense. What I mean by this is that if you were to look closely at Malcolm's political activities after leaving the Nation of Islam in 1963, in particular Malcolm's writings, speeches, interviews, personal letters, and travel diaries, one would find a, a mutual feeling of friendship. Uh, from July 64 to February 1965, Malcolm had nothing but praise for Babu, for his ability to help, to help him broaden his thinking and give articulation to how African-American freedom movement was to be internationalized. So the question that I have here is in what ways does Babu and Malcolm X's uh, political, personal uh, friendship challenge us to understand how a black radical tradition has its own politics of friendship? So really, what does it mean to be friends? 
to be, create close friends. Oftentimes when we look at international, transnational histories, and we talk about transnational networks and network building, um, I think we take for granted the kind of personal connections that are being made between groups of individuals or individuals, uh, between two individuals. And so what struck me about looking through Malcolm X's writings is that, like Babu's reflections in his memoir and in that speech in 1990, Malcolm, uh, from 64 to 65, like I said, would talk about Babu more so than anyone I, 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 I actually uh, would, um, uh, other African leaders um, that he encountered throughout his travels uh, in 1964 throughout the continent in the Middle East. Uh, and so it struck me that Babu takes on a kind of special importance to Malcolm X. And so I wanted to kind of pursue that more. And the fact that Babu refers to Malcolm as friend and the fact that Malcolm says that out of all the 50 or some odd contacts he makes abroad, Babu is someone who's uh, particularly uh, important. And as I continue to think about this more and more, uh, 2011 comes and Mary, Mary, Many Marbles' uh, biography of Malcolm X comes out. And if people are familiar with this text, it is probably the most you know, definitive biography so far uh, out of all the biographies of Malcolm X. Uh, and so a lot of criticism has come out against the book. Malcolm's homosexuality, Malcolm's relationship with uh, Betty, Shabazz, his wife, things that where Maribel, try, Maribel tries to kind of break down this kind of icon, iconog uh, iconographic figure. One thing, though, is that we see when Maribel goes into uh, Malcolm's international uh, travels, 64, 65, he spares very little attention to his time abroad. And then when we get to Tanzania, he literally spends about a paragraph. So for me, I'm like, wow. He still doesn't kind of bring out how important this relationship, out of all the relationships, I think, um, important this relationship is. And so I wanted to kind of, again, Maribel kind of influenced me in thinking about uh, friendship and the politics of friendship. Uh, and as you see in my uh, abstract, I also talk about Jack Derrida and uh, how he talks about the politics of friendship as a source of inspiration. And I'll talk about that at the end of, of this paper. So let me go into a quick kind of bio here. Uh, Babu, important, here's a picture of him. Um, Somali, not Somali, uh, Arab, Ethiopian, Swahili, uh, Swahili uh, cultural heritage. Uh, he lost his father at the age of one, his mother at the age of two. Very similar in a lot of ways to Malcolm X losing his parents, but at a, a, a bit of a, a, when he was uh, in his teens. Um, like a lot of uh, colonial subjects at the time, because he's from the island of Zanzibar, which is off uh, East Africa, off the coast of Tanzania, uh, uh, mainland Tanganyika. Uh, it's a it's history of slavery, a very racially stratified society. Um, so we see Babu coming as this petty bourgeois background. He was raised by his great aunt. And then in the 50s, he goes to London to study, usually along that trajectory of going to be a kind of colonial, you know, working for the colonial system but then going to London and immersing himself in that radical political culture of pan-Africanism, <laughs> anarchism, even uh, you know, Marxism, Babu gets kind of radicalized and, ch and that kind of changes his um, political career, I think, in a lot of ways. And so uh, in the 50s, Babu returns in 57 to Zanzibar and serves as the Secretary General of the Zanzibar Nationalist Party and he completely reorganizes, reforms that party to be more inclusive to workers, to Africans, uh, because uh, ZNP before him was largely Arab dominated by the Arab ruling elite. Uh, and so he tries to make this into a mass political <coughs> party uh, with some success. Uh, after, uh, into the 60s, as Zanzibar is moving more towards independence, uh, Babu breaks free and forms the Uma Party, uh, which is a very kind of radical group, youth oriented. Uh, and this party would go on to play a role in the revolution in January 1970, 1964. Because in December of 63, um, we see the ZMP after Babu left, um, wins control, uh, wins the general election, uh, and people thought this was flawed. Babu thought this um, was uh, something that was more of a, of a British kind of controlled independence, or move to, um, to national independence. And so Babu forms this party, and then this revolution breaks out. That the, Uma, that the Uma party plays a role in, which I think is important, although um, the extent to which they planned the revolution uh, is still uh, up for debate. So, other things that I think are important to Babu and his pan-Africanism, uh, Babu was essential for the formation of the Organization of African Unity 
before the organization of African Unity Forms in 1963, there was these regional kind of Pan-African groups, and Babu was uh, involved in the uh, East Africa and uh, Central Africa kind of Pan-African group, uh, and then which later goes on to be the OAU. He was uh, attended the All African Peoples uh, Conference in Ghana in '59, and Babu was part of the delegation that actually found Lumumba in the Congo. When no one knew of Lumumba, they found him and brought him to Ghana in '59. For that conference. Uh, and so Babu has played this role um, that I think is, uh, you know, very on par with what his peers were doing. And yet, when we look at the history, um, we don't see as uh, the credit, I think, or the discussion of Babu. Uh, and when we think about the scholarship, there's not a lot of stuff out there. I have right here his memoir. He came out with an edited volume, at least his, his life partner came out with the edited volume after he died. Um, some Tanzania scholars are beginning to uh, bring out Babu's role, particularly in Zanzibar during the early 60s. And so slowly but surely, we're coming out with works on Babu. When we compare that to Malcolm X, though, we see so much sources, so many sources, that as an historian trying to get an African perspective, I oftentimes had to look into Malcolm's uh, own uh, personal papers to try to find um, how this relationship developed over time. So there are basically four moments that um, contribute to this development of this relationship. First moment comes at the July 1964 Second Summit of the Organization of African Unity held in Cairo, Egypt. So Malcolm X at this time breaks free from the nation of Islam and forms the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And what he tries to do is internationalize the black freedom struggle. He tries to call it a human rights struggle. Part of the strategy is to bring um, the United States up on charges of human rights violations at the United Nations through the help of the OAU. That was Malcolm's agenda. And so what he does is he goes to Cairo uninvited and tries to get heads of state or member states of the OAU to bring the U.S. up on charges of human rights violation uh, of African American citizens. So he does that with some success, but I'll talk a little bit more about that. But I want to show you a, a quick clip. And this is of Malcolm X in Cairo talking about um, his agenda there. Thank you. Well, my sense is here to remind the uh, African history state that there are 22 million of us in America who are also African descent. And to uh, remind them also that we are the victims of uh, America's colonialism or American imperialism. And that uh, our problem is not an American problem, it's a human problem, not a Negro problem, it's a problem of humanity, not a problem of civil rights, but a problem of human rights. And what do you hope for from this conference? Well, we hope to uh, bring pressure upon them, or rather we hope to impress upon them the importance of their bringing pressure and world opinion upon the United States to take some meaningful efforts to solve our problem in America. We want them to help us get our problem before the United Nations and charge America with violating our human rights in the same way that South Africa is charged with violating the human rights of our people in that era. And what uh, sort of reaction have you been getting from the African leaders? Well, I've gotten a good reaction, a very sympathetic reaction, and an understanding reaction. Many of them have been misinformed by the American government into thinking that uh, black people in America don't identify with Africa, and therefore they restrain themselves from voicing uh, their interest in our problems. I've, I've impressed upon them that our problem is their problem as well as their problem to our problem. So, Malcolm eventually is able to deliver his appeal to the heads of state. It's, a, it's actually a written document, and the heads of state actually respond to it officially. Uh, so you can actually go to the OAU uh, or the African Union website and look in their archives and you actually find their statement on the African American freedom struggle. Now, what made that possible, however, was Babu. They met for the first time in Cairo. Malcolm was spending a lot of his time in the hotel lobbies where all the liberation movements and other African heads of state were staying. And he uh, encountered Babu and they talked for a really long time. And Babu was very impressed with Malcolm having come from the United States on his own to try to get Africans to see that their struggle, that their struggle is linked to the African American freedom struggle. So although heads of state basically said that they are very pleased with the, the pace of racial progress in the United States in that statement, 
a lot of people see that as a kind of rejection of Malcolm's plan or Malcolm failing uh, in his time abroad. But if we look at it from, from the perspective of this kind of friendship that I'm talking about, it was Babu who actually saw the kind of meaning to this, went to Julius Nyerere, the president of Tanzania, said, you have to put this on the agenda for at least us to have the conversation, which I think is, a, is an important step. Because otherwise, this would have never actually been, uh, been an official statement to come out uh, on uh, the African-American freedom struggle that could be used as a kind of point of departure to continue in this, I think, ongoing dialogue about what does Pan-Africanism mean when you're talking about independent nation states and people in the diaspora who, in some shape or form, at least in the African-American context, don't see themselves as citizens of the US. So that's just one example. At that conference, after that conference, Babu invites Malcolm to come to Tanzania. And so here. Comes to Tanzania in October 1964. And this is where we see the relationship really, really deepen. Uh, Babu serves as his kind of unofficial host and takes Malcolm all over the country. Zanzibar, Malcolm meets his family, Malcolm meets uh, revolutionary leaders from everywhere uh, because Tanzania at the time was beginning to serve as a place of exile for political groups largely in Central and uh, Southern Africa. And so this is again where Malcolm starts to, at least in his diary entries, talk about how Babu is kind of uh, making this huge impact on his political thinking. Where Malcolm's again moving more towards a human rights uh, uh, articulation of the problem as well as Malcolm moving towards a, a, a critique of capitalism uh, and uh, in a way that he's starting, not, not necessarily saying that he's a supporter, uh, a supporter of socialism, but at least he says we can't have capitalism. And that's a break from what he was doing in the Nation of Islam, which promoted a very kind of black capitalist agenda. So Babu uh, played a role in that. I'm kind of moving quickly because I want to get to Babu's political writings. Um, the third moment that they meet was at, is, it was in New York City. Babu was part of the Tanzanian delegation to the United Nations. And so they took that as an opportunity to finally create a common platform that they could, uh, both an African-American organization, Tanzanian, could actually start to uh, have a kind of common uh, approach to some of these problems that they're trying to address. And so in this case, it was the Congo crisis. What was happening in 64 when he brought the Belgian paratroopers, U.S. planes, some, uh, some anti-Castro pilots, and saving some Belgian um, expatriates from uh, what was taking place in the Congo in 64. Malcolm and Babu saw that as a rallying point for them to say that we can have this kind of common uh, foreign policy agenda. And so for a series of about three or four days, Malcolm X has Babu speak for the OAAU, Malcolm's organization in Harlem, as well as Babu speaks at a number of different other rallies and panels uh, organized by um, either labor groups or other black groups, uh, black nationalist groups in Harlem. And so what Babu begins to do is start to articulate, again, uh, the meaning of his relationship with Malcolm X, but also starts to talk about the Congo in a way that I think really gets at this idea of a politics of friendship. Both Malcolm X and Babu start to really try to draw distinctions between who's friend and who's foe in this world, um, in, the, in the political world. And what I mean by that is that we see um, Malcolm X and Babu really starting to attack the US media, the Western imperialist press as they call it, for the way that they frame the issues taking place in Africa on who we should be siding with and who we should be um, opposed, uh, in opposition to. And so this is really interesting because the language starts to come out more and more enemy, friend. Uh, Malcolm telling them not to trust the US friendly approach to African foreign policy. Uh, and then again, we see Babu also trying to identify um, the Congo to an American audience in a way that's saying um, that US imperialism ties the African freedom struggle as well as the African American freedom struggle in the context of having a same uh, enemy uh, or, or a common foe. How much time do I have? No! <laughs> take a little more. Saucy's not here, so you can take a little more time. <laughs> here we have uh, another example, uh, a picture of Malcolm X and um, Babu. Babu right here, shaking Malcolm X's hand. I forgot this gentleman's name. I think it's Bashir from Sudan. Um, but we see this taking place throughout. And Babu stays in New York until about February, and this is where they have this these series of private meetings that are very hard to 
define what actually went down in those meetings, but they keep referring to those meetings as ways that, as moments that really um, solidified their friendship. Now, the thing that I really wanted to talk about to give you an idea of how this relationship develops over time is that Malcolm X is assassinated in 1965. And after that, Babu begins to write more and more about black power after he joins the one-party state newspaper, The Nationalist in Tanzania. He gets an editorial, it's called Pressman's Commentary. So every, pretty much every week he's writing these, editorial, uh, these editorials about imperialism, about African unity, about, um, let's see, uh, the Vietnam War, uh, about uh, student movements, uh, and then we also see him talking about black power. And so one of the things that I argue is that I don't think we, Babu would, would have gotten to that point without this kind of relationship that he forged with Malcolm X because it gives him, I think, a deeper insight into the politics of the movement and it allows him to approach it in a way that I think is interventionist. Because if we look at the 60s and 70s, particularly with uh, some of Af the African left and their response to African American nationalists is that you don't have the correct ideology. It becomes very ideologically stringent. Um, you guys are focused too much on race. Where's your class analysis? And so over 60s into the 70s, that debate still is unfolding on very kind of ideological lines. And what I see with Babu is that we see Babu as someone who's not necessarily this kind of ideologue, but someone open uh, to understanding uh, internal situations on their own terms. Um, we also see someone who looks to youth uh, and youth as a vanguard. We also see Babu as someone who talks about revolutionary spontaneity, and he sees that in the urban rebellions that take place in the United States throughout uh, some of these cities. Uh, and so we see Babu beginning to identify certain features about the black power movement from about 65 to uh, 68 in a way that's reframing it, in a way that's reframing it to both challenge Western imperialist press characterizations of black power as this kind of crazy, anti-white movement uh, and Babu is trying to draw out its complexity so an African audience can understand the connection. And I'm going to end up. So we see about uh, five or six articles. Babu writes about Stokely Carmichael and which is pictured right here in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He writes about the death of King and how, we, and how King was ultimately this kind of petty bourgeois, neo comprador,ial elite who um, really, I think, you know, put a, a kind of a, a cover over the black power movement because he was the acceptable form of protest. We see him come out in support of Stokely Carmichael, who came to Tanzania in 67 and pretty much uh, angered everybody uh, with what he was in his critique of African governments, in his critique of whites in liber involvement in liberation movements. And so it causes crazy uproar that Babu intervenes again and says, okay, you have certain elements, we can be critical of black power, but let's not forget some of the other salient features of it that connect it, that connect it to our freedom struggle, uh, which I think is really, really important. Uh, I'm just gonna end here real quick uh, and talk a little bit why I'm looking at uh, friendship. One, again, I think it's something that is uh, underappreciated, uh, and this is where Jacques Derrida's uh, French philosopher deconstructionist comes in because he looks at a politics of friendship in the Western uh, intellectual tradition and seeing it as this kind of something that's always there but never really identified. And, and I think that's one way that we can think about Pan-Africanism, particularly when we take it outside the boundaries of the continent and try to talk about the diaspora. Uh, is that this is something that these networks are built along these personal relationships and friendships that I think are, um, again, important for us to understand the development of those relationships because it contributes to these processes of continually thinking about ways to collaborate in a way that's mutually beneficial. Uh, and then, again, revisiting, I think, Malcolm X and Babu, um, we also see them, I think, offering for us today this lesson on the press uh, and the media and I mean, they're talking about the 60s and where we're at now with the massive corporatization of media, as well as the media telling us who our friends and enemies should be. I think it's important for them to always come back to Malcolm Babu, who kept telling us to kind of weigh peoples and weigh situations um, using our own kind of knowledge, right? And not letting other people tell us who our friends should be and who our enemies should be. And, and I think that um, another uh, significant aspect of this relationship is that because this takes place in 64, what we see happen 
from 66 to 74 are a whole bunch of African Americans who saw themselves as followers of Malcolm X in a very kind of ideological way and saw and studied what Malcolm was doing, particularly in 64 and 65 after he broke away from the Nation of Islam and really try to implement some of those things that Malcolm um, was trying to do in terms of building collaborative ties with Africans and African states. And so all of a sudden we see an influx of African Americans from uh, going to Tanzania to try to be active participants in this, na in this uh, nation building project. And, and what they said were not trying to be uh, tourists, um, but trying to actually build uh, African socialist society that would be beneficial to both Africans as well as African Americans. And I don't, and uh, I'll stop there. connection to global Pan-African movements. Uh, she has written and presented on the Universal Ethiopian Student <coughs> Association and uh, the journal that began as their organ, the African Journal of Af the African the Journal of African Affairs, which uh, I guess was issued between 1937 and 48, and is an example of modern Ethiopianism. So here we go. Um, so okay. I think this is actually great to follow up. <coughs> Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for having me, um, and I think that um, these issues that Seth brings up about the connections between what is now, you know, called the African diaspora, I mean, there have always been different names for, for this, you know, world, this black world, or whatever you want to call it, um, uh, and, and the types of nationalisms, right, because the, the type of this conference is nationalisms, right, so in the first panel, at the beginning, there was, and the concern was raised about, you know, what kind of nationalism are we talking about, right? Are we talking about a, you know, a small p pan-Africanism or a big p pan-Africanism in the way that George Shepherson um, talked about in the 60s? Uh, and so I kind of wanted to take us back a little bit um, into the 30s and talk about this organization called the Universal Ethiopian Students Association, which, by the way, had no Ethiopians in it. Uh, and that signals to the uh, kind of symbolic importance of Africa and the real importance of Africa and the symbolic importance of Ethiopia and the real importance of Ethiopia. Um, and so in kind of what this, what looking at their organ can tell us uh, about um, the way first that African identity is made and forged, so pan-African identity, but really I'm actually talking about the word African, right? So what does it mean when uh, what does African mean in different contexts, right? And when you come together in a place, for example, they were, um, they began in Harlem, so it was a place where West African students, Caribbean students, and African American students, and, and activists and intellectuals in general, um, met and, and, you know, I wouldn't call them a movement, but I will tell you about it in a second. But, um, but what does that mean for them to call themselves Ethiopian? What does it mean for them to call themselves African? Um, and how did they mobilize this identity? The other thing that I'm really interested in um, is how we talk about imperialism, right? So um, usually when we talk about imperialism in the 20th century, the assumption is we're talking about European colonialism, European empire, right? In Africa, going to other places. I want us to think a little bit about kind of indigenous African imperialism, and specifically in the Horn of Africa, specifically Ethiopia as an empire. So thinking about black empire um, is important, I think. And I don't know if people are familiar with George Schuyler, um, who was kind of a really prolific um, African-American intellectual and writer. He, he kind of had a really long history. Um, he started off kind of radical, became really conservative. And just a really interesting thinker, I think. Um, but he wrote this kind of um, back to the future type science fiction uh, thing that was serialized in the Pittsburgh Courier in the 30s, and it's called Black Empire, and it's kind of a satire uh, about the Liberia Project. Um, and if I had more time, just keep that in, you know, put that beat in your mind and think about it for a minute, and, and we can return to that later. But I want us to think about what it means when we have competing discourses, right, about um, empire, European colonialism, and 
but then we also have a different kind of imperialism happening in the Horn of Africa, which um, did actually act to curtail the self-determination of certain types of African nationalism, right? So, for example, I mean, it's, the, the discussion is it's current, right? When we think about Eritrea, Somalia, parts of Sudan, um, and their relationship to Ethiopia, right? Okay, so that's kind of the context of what I want to uh, talk about. So I guess first, um, I don't know, are people familiar with the term Ethiopianism and what it means? Yes? No? no. Yeah? Okay, so... Okay, that means no. All right, no, I'll just, okay, just a little, like, thing. Um, <clears throat> William R. Scott, who is probably one of the foremost um, historians of Ethiopianism uh, today, defines Ethiopianism just generally as a set of ideas or beliefs associated with the selective reading of the Bible and Western classics from which was forged a sense of collective historical consciousness in the African uh, diaspora. So the, um, it's really based on not based on, but this Psalm 6831, um, Princes shall come out of Egypt, Ethiopia shall soon stretch forth her hands unto God, uh, was something that Africans, mainly in the English-speaking diaspora, places that were Protestant, identified with. So basically it's account, comes from a counter-reading of the Bible, looking at Ethiopia, not necessarily the nation-state, right, but the empire, um, as a source of his pride, um, racial pride. Uh, and consciousness, and kind of a collective, an idea of collective redemp redemption that comes that comes out of that. Um, so that's essentially what it is. And there have been debates um, whether or not it's a secular, or like becomes a secular discourse, or is it always something that kind of has this theological or biblical root, um, no matter what. Um, but generally, uh, that's what it is. So it's basically Ethiopia as a symbol for Africa. Um, and so, in a book called The Redemption of African Black Religion, St. Clair Drake offers one of the clearest and perceptive scholarly analyses of the development of Ethiopianism in the African diaspora. So, he maintains that the black church in the U.S. can be analyzed as having institutionalized a form of Pan-Africanism early in the 19th century without ever calling it that, but also that Ethiopianism became more complex and secularized as it developed in the 19th and 20th centuries. So he traces Ethiopianism um, from its roots as a vindicationist myth in Christian and syncretic spiritual traditions um, in the US and the Caribbean through its role in the 19th century um, emigrationist movements so to Liberia and West Africa um, and church movements in South Africa um, to its role in religious political movements in the 20th century. So uh, he points to uh, Blyden was a, an early uh, black nationalist, um, vital role in the development of modern Ethiopianism and its turn toward political and intellectual activity focused on African independence, right? And he says that for him, for Blyden, Ethiopianism ceased to be either an escapist ideology for people in diaspora or a spur to immigration and became rather an ideology sanctioning the development for Africa by Africans themselves. And I'm sure for you, those of you are familiar with Garvey and Krumah. There's this genealogy, right? Like Blyden, Garvey, Krumah. Um, that, that language comes up again and again, right? Africa for Africans. So Drake implies that there's an innate relationship between Ethiopianism, Pan-Africanism, and African self-rule and nationalism, right? So I quote, the logical end of Ethiopianist thinking is the position that Africans themselves are thoroughly competent to chart their own course of development and to manage their own affairs. When shorn of Christian beliefs about degeneration and redemption, Ethiopianist thinking leads to belief that the forces are latent within it, within Africa, to redeem it. So in my discussion or my research um, on the e e Universal Ethiopian Students Association, my idea, and I'm still working it out here, so this is workshoppy, is that they represent this kind of new generation of vindicationists. They're clearly nationalists, right? Clearly they are, and I'll explain how. Um, but there is an element of this kind of classical Ethiopianism that they keep with them, which is a deep reverence for Ethiopia. And it's kind of a mishmash of like the new Ethiopia that you're seeing um, after 1935, the Italian invasion, and then an older idea of an imperial Ethiopia. Um, so 
they uh, yeah so so here I'll talk about uh, I'll describe them a bit and um, so I think that their Ethiopianism is vindicationist meaning you know to kind of redeem this um, image of Africa and Africans around the world um, but and it's secular into political nationalism which brought Africans on the continent Africans and diaspora together in the same kind of discursive and political space um, and in a place where they could assert a, a pan-Africanist identity and activity, which was both geared towards independence and self-rule in the diaspora of the Caribbean, um, but also very much hinged upon the maintenance of Ethiopia's own sovereignty. So it was like, in 1935, Italy invades uh, Ethiopia, right? Um, and we must do everything we can to maintain Ethiopia's independence. The only way that we will free ourselves is if but there's a little bit of a contradiction there, right? Which is that Ethiopia has its own designs in the Horn of Africa, right? And Ethiopia does not really care about, I mean, there's a, in the 40s and 50s, there's this question of what to do with Eritrea, right? Um, does, you know, Italy, it's been taken away from Italy, so what's going to happen? Ethiopia wants to maintain it. And these students uh, are very much in favor of Ethiopia maintaining its maintaining its old borders and actually expanding its borders um, in, in the Horn of Africa. So just to tell you a bit about the organization, it was founded in the late 1928-30s um, in New York City. And some prominent members, um, I'll just name a few, John Henry Clark, um, David Talbot, um, who was a Guyanese-born journalist who ended up actually working for the Ethiopian government for a long time, um, and cousin of uh, Tiras Mokonin, Chinese um, Pan-Africanist. Um, uh, Amy Jacques Garvey was involved in the organization, so she was the co-editor of their of their journal, The African, for quite a while, as well as George Schuyler um, was as well. <coughs> the organization also attracted and involved many African students, um, so mainly from Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya, and they were columnists. They had their own. You know, there were correspondence, foreign correspondence, um, and I don't know how many of you would be familiar with these names, um, but Ofori Of from the Gold Coast, um, Prince H. Akiki Nyabongo from Uganda, whose granddaughter was on Oprah recently because she <laughs> married someone. Um, anyway. um, and uh, they had, also Namdi Zikiwe, there was, there was, um, they would reprint things from daily comment from Nigeria. So there's a lot of interaction with West African Nigerians. Um, in terms of their identity, I it seems to me in looking at the newspaper, which is kind of, it started off very much as like a, just an Oregon, right? Like we are the Universal Ethiopian Students Association, right? Kind of a very garbiest um, type of thing. Um, but in terms of their practice, it's really interesting because they would reprint things from the New York Times, they would be reading um, all kinds of publications, periodicals, but the only time they would cite would be from white papers, right? So they they would carry things from African, other African newspapers or Caribbean newspapers, but they wouldn't they wouldn't cite them. And I, you know, actually the reason I I was thinking about this is I went to um, a conference, an African Studies conference, and the people who kind of set it up was a newspapers workshop. And the language they were using was, what do we do about these Africans who are borrowing and plagiarizing? And this is just sloppy journalism. What's up with all the sloppy journalism in the 30s, right? Like, why aren't these Africans citing each other? And I thought about it, and I was like, well, you know, they're not dumb people. These are intellectuals. These are people who go on to lead their nations. What's going on? And so, in a sense, in terms of identity and in terms of what... Um, what it means to be an African, right? I, I, I really think this was, it worked on two levels. One is kind of a statement about who's African. Like, we're all African, right? We have to cite those guys. We have to cite the Times. We have to cite the New York Age, whatever. But why do we have to cite each other? I'm talking about my friend. So this friendship thing is interesting. And it was also a lot of, I think it might have been to protect um, kind of their friends and um, their sources, right? So there was... Um, this kind of thing going on. So maybe the, uh, it was a political strategy, I guess, is, is 
So this organization was, like I said, there were no Ethiopians involved, and but it was kind of a, a, a point in a constellation of other similar organizations. So for example, there was the Ethiopian Research Council at Howard University, um, which um, Leo Hansberry was involved in. Um, there was the Ethiopian World Federation, which actually, if you're familiar with the Shashimani settlement in Ethiopia, where like now Rastas, a lot of Rastas go there, this was the organization that was basically had a Selassie granted the land grant to them. Um, and um, and they're, they're a big organization now. But these were all organizations working in the 1930s after, the, after and during the Italian invasion of Ethiopia. And their main goal um, was to make sure that Ethiopia did not um, get colonized. And, and a lot of the language that they used was um, we have to maintain Ethiopia's sovereignty so that we will all be redeemed. And this is kind of very Ethiopianist language, although they're not religious, um, religious per se. Um, so I think in terms of this title, right, of my of, of the talk, like Africa Irredenta, where does that come from? Um, and irredentism, I don't know if I need to explain, explain that, but uh, you know, just generally it's this idea of unredeemed parts of um, a political unit that should be ours. So for example, I think it came up out in Italy, right, during World War One, and so you had parts of Italy that Italian thought were like culturally it should be politically part of Italy as a unit, as a nationalist unit, but we're in the Prussian Empire or we're here or there, right? Um, so it's this this idea of kind of bringing back together a nation, a nation from other imperial uh, uh, units, and the language of irredentism was used throughout here. So basically, it was Africa irredenta, Africa irredenta, um, Ethiopia has to get back parts of its empire that were taken away by, by the Europeans. So in Pan-Africanism from Within, which is T. R. S. McClendon's um, biography, uh, he talks about being part of, uh, that was, the way they thought about Africa Irredenta was in a kind of a Garvey style nationalism, and that, that's what he calls it. This organization, um, the UASA, put out a pamphlet in 1936 called Ethiopia, a nation blocked from the sea. Um, and they had a, a mathematical equation basically saying um, Ethiopia is to Africa what Sardinia is to Italy, right? So they're very consciously um, invested in, 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 in uh, Ethiopia's um, freedom. So, um, in terms, how much time do I have? Five. Five minutes? Okay. Okay, so that's just... The, the background on the organization, and they're really just a case study to illuminate some of the contradictions about nationalism and anti-imperialism um, during this period. So, um, and I wish I had my thing working so I could show you, but but I guess what I'm trying to say about them is that the discourse found in, the, in their activities and their materials um, and their relationships um, definitely engaged, if not influenced, the nascent liberatory pan-African nationalist and decolonization movements of the time, but at the same time, they reinforced a more conservative nationalist discourse, both a, I don't know if conservative is the right word, um, but, you know, kind of a black, uh, a racial nationalism, which I don't think is inherently conservative, but anyway, um, uh, and kind of uh, supported Ethiopia's say oppressive, but that could be imperialist designs in the Horn of Africa, right? So there's this kind of tension between Ethiopianism being liberatory um, and emancipatory discourse in diaspora, but when you bring it to Africa in different parts, and maybe even West Africa, but when you bring it to uh, the Horn of Africa, what does the celebration of a black empire do? And interestingly enough, in all of their materials that I've seen so far, fully in support of trusteeship of Eritrea, and this is in the 40s and 50s, um, and Somaliland, right? There is no discussion of, hmm, maybe, you know, these Eritrean nationalists, maybe they really should have a point, right? Their grievances, maybe their grievances are, are valid. No. And so um, I kind of, I wanted to 
a quote by George Schuyler. So this is somebody who's, if anyone's familiar with him, he's really, I mean, he's, I hate the word rational, but he's hyper-rational all the time. He's always talking in political terms. Um, uh, so you, you wouldn't think of him, you wouldn't think that he is an Ethiopianist in, in the kind of classical sense. Um, but he writes, right, um, this is 1946, right? And this is in a discussion of whether or not, uh, what should happen with Eritrea um, and parts of uh, British Somaliland, right? Uh, and he's championing, championing that Ethiopia should, should uh, <laughs> retain them, get them back. So he says, Yemen, the original Sheba from which Solomon's sweetheart journeyed to Jerusalem, is about to be recognized by the United States for the first time. Yemen is an Ethiopian country, although on the southern coast of the Red Sea. Herodotus divided Ethiopians into two groups, those west of the Red Sea and those east of it. Yemen is important to the United States at this time because of its trade outlet to Saudi Arabia, the most powerful Arabian country, and the site of valuable oil concessions held by American oil concerns. The average Yemenite looks like the average person you see on Lenox Avenue, South Street, Wiley Avenue, Beale Street, or the South Parkway. And, end quote. So, it seems odd that he would draw on biblical and kind of this ancient geography um, <coughs> to discuss like a contemporary political uh, situation, and that he would take Yemen's kind of national recognition and recast it into an Ethiopian frame. Um, it, it is, I think it's it's odd, and I don't think it's a mistake. Um, so, um, so I just wanted to maybe just pose some questions, and I, I know it's kind of like on a forum, but I really don't know how to think about this, because also the literature, it's crazy to deal with the literature, right? You got Ethiopian studies over here, that doesn't engage with anything or anybody. Then you have African studies, then you have, you know, African American, you know, diaspora studies. And it seems like for me, Ethiopianism is a category that allows all of these disparate literatures to talk to each other and it reflects a reality that in academia sometimes we separate out. I don't know whether it, why that's done. It could be, I don't know, the histories and the traditions of these different. Um, so to me it was odd that, that this hasn't really been talked about much and so I'm trying to find a way to kind of talk about these, these, uh, these tensions. Um, so yeah. So, like I said, how is African um, engaged the idea of African, right? But linked to both a diasporic and con continental Africanness, um, and linked to Ethiopia, both symbolic and real. How is it engaged as a political identity during this period? Um, and what do the relationships forged um, that we see mainly in this print culture, but also there's a lot, there's, there's a lot of activity going on in terms of tenant organizing and that kind of stuff in these local spaces. Um, so what does that tell us about how people thought of themselves? Um, secondly, um, what does this discourse around race and imperialism in the pages of the African um, or and other periodicals reveal about the contradictions inherent in Ethiopianism, especially once we integrate modern Ethiopian history and politics into our analysis? And on this point, I think it's really important to think about how race is seen in the Horn of Africa, right, and the racial hierarchies and the very kind of different ways that at least at this point um, blackness is conceived. It's not like a black Atlantic idea of blackness, right? So there was a, someone who wrote in a letter who said, you know, I'm so happy. I love Haile Selassie. I love that you have, have him on your cover, but I'd never seen him before and I didn't know he was a white man. <laughs> and then the editor had to like quickly write back and say, oh no, he just looks white, but he's not, you know, and they so, you know, kind of described his features and said, Rest assured, the man is not white, right? So there's a lot of work that has to be done to when Ethiopia becomes a real place with real people. There's a lot of work that has to be done to, to make it work with this kind of Pan-African, um, uh, you know, for these projects. Um, um, and yeah, I think I think I'll I'll leave it there. But those are the questions I have. And, and thank you.
speaker is Aaron Kamungisha. He's a lecturer in cultural studies at the University of the West Indies, Cape Hill campus. He completed his PhD here at York in my department, Social and Political Thought, and was a 2007 postdoctoral fellow in the Department of African American Studies at the Western University. His current work is the study of coloniality, cultural citizenship, and freedom in the contemporary Anglophone Caribbean. Uh, mediated through the social political thought of CLR James and Sylvia Winter. Aaron. Aaron. All right, so um, let me start by thanking the organizers for inviting me here. Um, uh, special thanks, probably because I know them so well, to the Sun team and Pablo for inviting me here. I mean, um, there are some people who you would travel across the world to see, you know, and if they ask you to come, even though I'm coming from 28 degrees Celsius weather in Barbados, um, you would still come. But um, for Sun team or Pablo, I would travel across the solar system if they asked me to come somewhere. So um, I'm very glad to be here. Um, the paper I am going to do today, um, I'm hoping resonates for us with Cabral's work, um, but I only actually directly engage this work towards the end, so actually I was a little concerned about it at first, but given the nature of this panel, I think it hopefully will fit within the spirit of this panel. And um, you just missed my big up of you, Pablo. Uh, <laughs> missed it. Anyway, you missed my big up of you. I, did, I, 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 I heard it and watched it. You made what you Ah, okay. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. Indeed, indeed. All right. So, um, and I want to start with two quotes. Uh, the first one should probably be familiar to us. It's from Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. And it's one line. Each generation must, out of relative obscurity, discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. And the second one is from CLR James's Party Politics in the West Indies, and it goes as follows. People of the West Indies, you do not know your own power. No one dares to tell you. You are a strange, a unique combination of the greatest driving force in the world today, the underdeveloped, formerly colonial colored peoples. Know that at this stage of world history, and your own history, there can never be any progress in the West Indies unless it begins with you and grows as you grow. In 1961, a hemisphere apart, two Caribbean intellectuals made powerful statements about the historical conjuncture their communities inhabited, statements filled with a desperate urgency for the future of the anti-colonial revolution to which they had dedicated their lives. These were indeed heady times. A year previously, 17 African countries had gained their independence, while the Caribbean had been shaken by Cuba's revolution of 1959. Despite the collapse of the West Indian Federation, or rather the imminent collapse at that time of West Indian Federation, independence of the Anglophone Caribbean was on the horizon, with Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago gaining theirs in 1962, followed by Guyana and Barbados in 1966, and associated state status for much of the rest of the Anglophone Caribbean in 1967. Yet simultaneously, the tragedy of neocolonialism was never far from the surface. The Republic of the Congo's first Prime Minister, Patrice Lumumba, had been deposed and murdered in a coup stage managed by Western imperialism, while the nature of the demise of the West Indian Federation and the temper of its elites left no reason to believe that the quality of the Anglophone Caribbean's independence would be anything less than neocolonial. Now that CLR James and Franz Fanon are perhaps the exemplary political thinkers of the Caribbean's 20th century is scarcely in doubt. But of their many fine contributions, I am actually drawn to this particular moment, the urgency of 1961, the year in which both men came to a reckoning with their vision of a post-colonial order, its promise and potential despite the specter of a creeping failure. Fanon wrote The Wretched of the Earth between April and July 1961, an almost unbelievable pace fueled by the need to complete it before leukemia ended his life, as indeed it did two weeks after the Wretched of the Earth's publication in Paris. CLR James's party politics in the West Indies, an account of his break with Eric Williams's People's National Movement in his native Trinidad and Tobago, was largely written in 1961, but published with a defined introduction which I've just quoted um, in 1962. 
Fanon will not live to see the culmination of the Algerian revolution with which he had thrown his lot, dying mere months before Algerian independence. While in Trinidad, James, who in three decades of writing and activism had done so much to usher in the conditions of possibility that would lead to Anglophone Caribbean independence, would slip away from Trinidad a few days before its independence was celebrated. Now in their text, Wretched of Year from Poly Pol Party Politics in the West Indies, both James and Fanon advance a critique of the new elites that were poisoned to guide third world countries to independence, which remains unsurpassed in its prescience about the persistence of colonial arrangements in the post-independent state. Fanon's well-known critique of the then newly emerging national elites um, reaches its zenith and is warming about what he called the pitfalls of national consciousness, chapter 3 of A Wretched of the Earth. But, for, but his conclusions about the limitations and corruptions of his class begin in its celebrated first chapter on violence. And I quote Fanon at length here, Spoiled children of yesterday's colonialism and today's national governments, these wily intellectuals emerged to organize the tremendous upheavals um, against colonialism from below. Unlike the bourgeoisie of Europe, Fanon says that these are not a true bourgeoisie. They are, I quote, a little greedy caste in a quest for its historic mission, that of intermediary between metropolitan power and the post-colonial masses. Beyond then, their power civic <coughs> irrelevance for Fanon, the national middle classes are to blame for the absence of a truly purposeful national consciousness, the fruits of their intellectual laziness, their spiritual penury, the profoundly cosmopolitan mode of existence. An imitation here, again for Fanon, weds bourgeois ideology and colonialism's dehumanizations. So Fanon will say, bourgeois ideology, which is the proclamation of essential equality between men, manages to appear logical in its own eyes by, invent by inviting the sub-men to become human and to take as their prototype Western humanity as incarnated in the Western bourgeoisie. And now James, who's writing against encroaching lethargy and the betrayals of the PNM in Trinidad, in concert with Fanon, stresses the intermediate position of the middle classes, a people with status, but no knowledge or experience of the productive forces of a country. Um, James's lament concerns the role of his class as a facilitator of colonial governmentality, its lack of historical imagination, any ideas of their own, or really, indeed, anything beyond the desire for acceptance by the ruling elites. Perhaps in one perspective, crystallizing into almost an ideology that James has suggests that the middle classes possess, I quote him, is an unshakable principle that they're in status, education, morals, and manners separate and distinct from the masses of a people. James would close by saying on this point, the ordinary people of the West Indies do not want to substitute new masters for old. They want no masters at all. History will take its course only too often a bloody one. And of course, 30 years later, our uh, into a neo global neoliberal project, which has seen appalling levels of material impoverishment for citizens of the global south, and soaring rates of violence in those societies, James's warning appears far more prescient than he could have imagined. And we're going to return to this towards the end of my paper. Now, these texts by Fanon and James constitute some of the most searching critiques, as I've said, of the new post-colonial elites by Caribbean intellectuals writing at this particular moment, Anglophone Caribbean independence 50 years ago. They also, however, represent a wider critical work by African diaspora <coughs> intellectuals on class formation beyond the reduction by colonialism of all people of African descent to almost undifferentiated governable singularity. And if we're going to go back and think and trace some of these moments in terms of thinking about um, our peoples of African descent, their class formation, then of course we would do well to go to the work of W.B. Du Bois um, and his work in the late 19th century um, in which he constantly faced the problem of racist caricatures and distortions of Africana communities' lives. And he well described this particular problem, of course, as the problem with the treatment of black people as the problem rather than as a people with problems. And I'm thinking particularly here of his 1896 um, essay on the problems of the Negro. By the mid-20th century, though, the African-American sociologist E. Franklin Fraser's classic monograph, Black Bourgeoisie, would sound a warning about the conspicuous consumption and genuflection to Euro-American tastes, styles, and ideals of this particular class.
And in a related fashion, we may see another gem that I picked up um, well, a few years ago, but I only managed to read some of it recently, and that's Nathan Hare's book, The Black Anglo-Saxons. And um, <coughs> The Black Anglo-Saxons is a very devastating indictment of the black elites, and it's influenced enough by Fraser for Oliver Cox to actually refer to them in a very critical introduction he does of this work as part of the same school of thought. Um, and it functions less as a structured historical sociological study, which is what Fraser is trying to do. And it's more a lampooning of a taste in the values of this elite. So it has a number of very sardonically titled chapters. Chapters titled things like the dignitaries, unit leaders, you know, or the mimics, the super citizens, the cosmopolitans. However, Cox makes a very important point in his critical introduction for his work, and it's actually to Nathan Hare's credit that he let this introduction stand, because often if somebody's writing a critical introduction to your work, you want it to be positive, while <laughs> Cox, on the other hand, is just slicing him, you know, all through the introduction. And what Cox says is, and he takes both Fraser and Hare as his target, and he says, this work is beset with methodological problems. There are flawed readings of class in this work, particularly in the description of black institutions. And he says that's part of a problem, but the problem is even more from this, because Cox is actually critiquing this work from even further to the left. And he's saying the problem with this particular work by Fraser and also Hare, even though I know what you're trying to know, I know how disgusted you are for black elites, is that it hardly confronts even tangentially a real power structure. Um, in this reading then by um, Fraser, um, in this reading then, the focus by Fraser and Hare on the foibles of the black upper class comes at actually the price of a deeper engagement with a critique of white supremacy in capitalist America. Now to return to the Caribbean and Anglophone Caribbean for a moment, intellectual labor on the question of a black middle class formation, whether a sociological study or a radical critique, lies in mesh within the debates about social stratification, pluralism, and cruelization debated by Caribbean theorists for the last 60 years. Historians of Anglophone Caribbean have noted that the defining feature of the black middle class in the post-emancipation era was their occupational status, a functional level of, his of literacy, and an investment in European cultural styles, behaviors, and attributes. However, this is interpolated by a complex series of social prohibitions and exclusions based on uh, questions of race and color. Black middle class respectability was thus secured by literacy and professional success, with educational accomplishments being the most highly prized single attribute distinguishing the black middle class from the poor and the peasantry. Profoundly reformist in its polit social and political outlook, and certain that the possession of European tastes and values would lead to their ascension to the ranks of a fully human, those middle classes of the 19th century seemed to fit well for Nonna James's description of them a century later. However, this same class also produced a number of prominent figures who advocated race pride in a vindicationless spirit. And here I'm particularly thinking of figures like J.J. Thomas of Trinidad and Robert Love of Jamaica, who stand as major figures in the genesis of a tradition of anti-colonial thought and political theorizing in the Anglophone Caribbean. And so we see here that even at the height of the colonial era, the difficulty of actually flattening the complexity of this class becomes clear. Now, the development of sustained intellectual labor on this question of a Caribbean social in the Anglophone Caribbean in the 50s is also twin to questions of class and race, and it's a particularly theoretically inventive era in Caribbean social thought. The theories, of this era, the theories of this era are well known to Caribbeanists and many others beyond the Caribbean under the nomenclature of the plantation school, pluralism, and creolization. And here I'd like to think about briefly about the work of the two Brathwits, Lloyd Brathwit and also Camel Brathwit. Now, Lloyd Bradford in 1953 writes a pioneering study called Social Stratification in Trinidad. And it's a quite remarkable study to read because in it he shows all of, um, in minute detail, of the different social and racial hierarchies, color, shade, kinship, and how in an ethnically diverse society how you have in the middle of the 20th century um, the entire society remaining captive to systems of domination developed under slave society and economy. In this ethnography of middle class tastes and assumptions, Bradford illustrates how the heraldry of whiteness permeates social and economic relations from the intricate assessment of potential marriage partners to the prospects of a career in co and color-coded fields of employment. The intermediary middle class in this colonial arrangement is not reactionary in any easy manner for Lloyd Bradford. Rather, he describes a tendency to radicalism 
along with one towards compulsive conformity simultaneously within them. Writing 20 years later, and in the development of a theory that was meant to serve as a forceful counterpoint to social stratification and plural society models, Campbell Braffitt would adopt a not completely undivorced trap, referring to the middle classes as, and I quote, the most, unfin the most finished product of unfinished creolization, uh, obsessive with mimicry with little po a subversive of potential, and an apt description of the descriptive value of whiteness in their lives. Now, in the 1960s and 70s, this post-independence critique actually reaches its zenith with the outpouring of leftist activism in the region. Here the Caribbean state became figure to gloss Marx's famous lines as merely a management committee for the affairs of a local bourgeoisie and international capitalist interests. And a highly significant but generally unheralded article by Walter Rodney is one of the best examples of the thought of this period. And I'm thinking here of his 1975 essay, which I know David would know from the Black Scholar, Contemporary Political Trends in the English-Speaking Caribbean. And that I think remains probably the best single argument um, article for understanding Rodney's analysis of a post-colonial Caribbean state. And he starts with the observation that most Anglophone Caribbean states by this time, 1975, have achieved their constitutional independence. And he ties this development to, of course, the um, dramatic collapse of European empire in the then 30 years post-World War II. The limited character of that independence is a central part of Rodney's considerations, and here we see an incredible depth to Fanon, particularly the Fanon of a wretched of the earth. The importance of distinguishing colonialism from neocolonialism is for Rodney that the patterns of politics continue to change after the initial transfer of power to a local ruling class. The consolidation of a new form of rule then in the post-colonial Caribbean represents not merely the continued march of Western imperialism, but the emergence of new forms of politics that require the use and clarification of the term neocolonialism. For Rodney, neocolonial politics are those that derive from the consolidation of a petty bourgeois as a class around the state. The appearance of this class over and over again across various Caribbean territories and in regimes that claim political orientations that should be different, from liberal democratic regimes to democratic socialists to authoritarian states, <coughs> leads Rodney to the declaration, and this is my all-time favorite quote by Walter Rodney, to speak of petty bourgeois dictatorship in the English-speaking Caribbean is no play with words. Okay, water for a moment. So, um, to move to today, um, because Rodney, of course, is writing at a time before the full advent of neoliberalism um, in the region, which, of course, many of us chart as emerging around uh, US-British access with Thatcher and Reagan in 1979-1980. And um, a generation later, um, with the collapse, of course, of social state socialist alternatives throughout the world, and also with the harsh conditionalities of structural adjustment, a curiously different accent has emerged in debates about the role of the middle classes in Caribbean society by members of the Caribbean left. And um, I've been tracking this for a few years before I decided to write this paper. And um, there are two figures that I want to think about, Don Robotham and Rupert Lewis, and essays by them specifically. But we're seeing shades of this in many of the other prominent political theorists in the Caribbean of this generation. So I'm thinking also, to some extent, of colleagues and uh, mentors and friends of mine like Brian Meeks and Patrick Henry and Trevor Monroe. And um, to think for a moment then about Robotham and Rupert Lewis's essays. Robotham publishes an essay in the mid-90s called Blackening the Nation in which he's following the then Jamaican Prime Minister P.J. Patterson's attempt in Jamaica to create a black capitalist class. Um, rather than the standard post-independence Caribbean arrangement of black political power and leadership in this cultural sphere um, and minority white economic dominance. And for Robotham, the black bourgeoisie has the potential in the course of its attempt to gain and consolidate power to implement reforms of critical benefit to the majority. That's for both of position. And there's more than a little suggestion here that capitalism is the only game in town, and that the sole question for the state 
um, is basically merely how one can walk the tightrope between satisfying a populist's demands and the acquisitive accumulation st uh, strategies and imperatives of capitalism. But further on, um, Robotham's commentaries on the Caribbean state um, lie entrapped within what I call the Jamaica Barbados polarity, which has a very long Caribbean history. And he gives it his own recent twist. And this is a twist that, if one is familiar with what's happening in Jamaica over the last 15 years or so, is replete on the talk shows. Barbados at one time was dismissed as a conservative side of this polarity, the revolution-reaction polarity between the two countries. Jamaica is revolutionary, Barbados is reactionary. However, it's now perceived as a society that has supposedly reached a laudable social consensus and peace. This is how desperate we have become in the Caribbean for alternatives. Okay? Um, so Robofon will actually say then, in an observation about the contemporary difference between the islands, that, and I quote, Barbadian prosperity is based on a pragmatic racial contract. Okay? And, um, I mean, readers of Charles Mills's The Racial Contract may have very much more, a lot indeed, to actually ponder about Robotham's use of a term or how any racial contract can be uh, pragmatic. But this is a particular position he's taking, and this is actually a very popular um, position in Jamaica on a number of the top shows. I mean, there's all of this idea that there's a Barbados model of development, uh, Barbados has done certain things right, we have got it wrong, etc., etc., etc. Okay? And we can discuss some dynamics around that more. In the time um, we have. Rupert Lewis now has a somewhat different Wait, essay. Huh? Oh, okay. Where? Three minutes. Oh, sure. Okay. All right. Um, his essay is called Reconsidering the Role of the Middle Class in Caribbean Politics. And um, he travels a relatively similar terrain. He says that the social democratic and Leninist ideas in the region have run their ideological course. Um, he says that past critiques of the middle class need updating. Uh, we need to understand the class mobility that's taken place in the last generation. We need to think about the question of entrepreneurial um, groups um, and the way in which the middle class can actually serve as an entrepreneurial class, which can be supposedly constitutively different in its vision and social outlook than the predatory minority colonial elite, uh, elites of the last few centuries. That's through Lewis in a nutshell. And these shifts leave very much to ponder, since they contain so much of dubious merit. One has to wonder why, of course, and one could actually argue why exactly do the Caribbean middle classes need to be explained at all, and certainly in this way. I mean, um, come on, I knew this computer was going to be strange at some point. I mean, um, in the end, um, what we're seeing really in the Caribbean is just a consolidation of historical patterns of bourgeois class domination. This is what we're seeing there in terms of the rise of this particular middle class. However, uh, what is concern of my concern about these new positions by the Caribbean left is that um, they're a little more than a slide away from revolutionary politics and towards a satisfaction with putatively social democratic regimes, but regimes that they know very well are suitor to client politics and when required participate in some of the most vicious forms of authoritarianism that you can imagine towards their local populations. But even beyond this, there is so much more to ponder about about the Caribbean present, which these analyses actually miss. One would think it was almost impossible to walk in the early days of 2013 without being haunted still by the legacy of Haiti's earthquake of three years past, the greatest tragedy the Caribbean has experienced since slavery, or alternatively to think about the question of the Tivoli Gardens massacre and the culmination of a particular predatory political culture in Jamaica. We also live in a time in which practically every single Anglophone Caribbean state is in a structural adjustment program, whether they announce it or not, because a lot of them are following the IMF program and are just basically not announcing it. Um, and the one that is not and is relatively on better economic footing, Trinidad and Tobago, has seen a tripling of its homicide rate in the last 10 years. <coughs> okay? So this is what two generations of post-independence middle-class rule has given us in the Caribbean. It's what Ato Sekiyotu describes as the, inco in the incoherent nationalism of dominant elites who are in reality transmitters and enforcers of capital's coercive universes. The vague defense of a contemporary Caribbean state by the Caribbean left is not as a result of an exhaustion of alternatives, but a disorderly retreat from their positions of two decades ago. 
Cabral's uncompromising call for a revolutionary consciousness from the 1966 Tricontinental Congress in Cuba rings through the decades. In the option, he presents the middle classes. Betray the revolution or commit suicide as a cause. And in closing, I actually want to return to James and Fanon and their epigraphs that I read above. Because both of them, of course, are speaking about nothing less than the responsibility of the third world for itself, but also for humanity. And while Fanon's critique of the middle class is who, to quote him, discover its historic mission, that of intermediary, between metropolitan power and the continued exploitation of the third world, is more devastating than James's at this particular moment of writings. It is in James's solitary critical engagement with Fanon that I think the weight of both men's perspective on the third world's colossal importance becomes clear. Um, an importance that, of course, Cabral would have understood and known only too well. In a January 1967 speech in Detroit, James would say the following about the wretched of the earth. Fanon was swept away by a certain conception, the necessity to finish off what is bound to corrupt and pervert the development of a colonial population. And the value of the book is not only what it says to colonials, it is recognized more and more by Europeans that something of this spirit is needed to rid from Western civilization the problems and burdens which are pressing down humanity as a whole. Now, I think that this is the final stage that we have reached so far. I don't know where we are going to reach tomorrow. Fanon calls this book Les Damnés de la Terre. It is translated as The Wretched of the Earth, but I prefer The Condemned of the World. I want to end by saying this. The work by black intellectuals, all of this is James, huh? The work by black intellectuals, stimulated by the needs of the black people, had better be understood by the condemned of the world, whether they're in Africa, the United States, or Europe. Because if the condemned of the world, of the earth, do not understand their past and know the responsibilities that lie upon them in the future, all on the earth will be condemned. That is the kind of world we live in. Thank you. Thank you.